Hello Windsor Academy Trust and welcome to my talk, Instructional Coaching. It's just a conversation, or is it? I'm so sorry that I can't be with you there in person today, but hopefully this video will make up for it. Where I'm going to try and uh, unpack instructional coaching. I know that it's something that you've been working on a lot as a trust at the moment, and I've been speaking to some of you about it over the last few months. And so in this session, we're going to try and unpick some of the potential pitfalls or roadblocks that we think come up uh, with instructional coaching. Now, I joined Reach Academy Feltham and all through school in southwest London in 2015, and uh, my interview was a little bit strange. I arrived at the school and I prepared a lesson. I was told that I was supposed to teach a lesson on adding adjectives to sentences. It was a year two lesson. So I prepared my lesson and I was, I was ready to deliver it and I had a class of year two children in front of me. I got in and I taught the lesson with a senior leader observing me at the back. So far, so normal. But what happened afterwards was a little bit peculiar, uh, something that I wasn't perhaps completely prepared for. Uh, after that lesson, um, we sat outside, me and the senior leader, and they gave me a little conversation. Uh, just a little conversation where they talked to me about the lesson. And rather than what I was used to, where they said, how do you think that that went? Uh, they told me that they wanted to zoom in on a particular area of my, of my lesson. Um, they wanted to talk about the, the part where we transitioned from the teaching to the independent task. So I'd modeled how to add adjectives to the sentence and the senior leader said, what happened next? Asked me that question, what happened next? And I said, well, I, I, I taught them, so I had a task ready for them and I sent them off to their tables to complete their task. The senior leader said, do you think that all of the children were ready to complete that task successfully? And that made me stop and think. <laughs> I thought, um, I think so. Can you be sure? The senior leader asked me. I guess I can't be completely sure. And you walked around the classroom and, and checked the, the students work as they were completing the independent task. What was your impression as you walked around? And that's when it struck me. I, I thought, well, yeah, actually I did notice that there were some children who were confused, some children who were struggling. They weren't quite ready to complete that task. Great, the senior leader said. And it was brilliant that you picked up on it when you were circulating. But what if you'd have known before you sent the children to their tables, which of those tasks, which of the children were ready to complete the task and which weren't? What could you have done? And I thought, well, if I'd have known that, then I would have been able to keep those children who weren't quite ready and go through a few more examples with them, maybe give them a couple of adjectives that they can have ready to put into their sentences. So the senior leader and I worked together on something different that I could do. Next time, I could instead, um, after the teaching, I could give all of the children a quick task, a sentence to complete, a sentence to add an adjective into. And if there are any children who are unable to do that in that moment, I could hold them back while the rest of the children began their independent practice. I didn't know it at the time, but that conversation was a coaching conversation. And I actually had the opportunity to immediately put it into practice. So. The senior leader told me that the other year two class was waiting for me and that I was going to teach the same lesson again, exactly the same lesson. And all I, need, all I needed to do was try and put that action step, that change in practice, uh, into my lesson. So I went into the next classroom and, and dutifully put it into practice and the lesson was much more successful. I was able to there and then stop uh, um, any children who uh, weren't ready to do the independent task um, and intervene in the moment when it mattered the most. And so, in a sense, a coaching conversation is just that. It's just a conversation. But it's much more than that. There's so much going on under the surface. And one of my worries with instructional coaching becoming much more popular is that it's treated as something that's very simple. It's treated as something that is just a conversation between colleagues. And I think that actually uh, it's more than that. I think it requires greater expertise, greater, greater judgment. Um, and I uh, think that if we don't take into account that, then it can lead to, it can lead to failure and it can lead to frustration. So, in this session, I'm going to talk through five of the biggest mistakes that I see when I'm working with schools or 
that I've committed myself in terms of instructional coaching. And I hope that they'll be useful as warning signs for you as you begin to embed instructional coaching into your schools, um, either leading on it um, or um, uh, coaching yourself. So what are those big five pitfalls? First, one of the big mistakes that I see is that there's no underpinning principles of effective teaching. No shared understanding of what really excellent looks like in terms of teaching and learning. The second is when imprecise action steps are given by coaches to coaches. The third is during the drop-in phase where there can be a lack of focus. Um, Coaches going in without really a forensic mindset of what they're trying to find. The fourth is not having enough, and in some instances, even any practice during the coaching conversation. And the last is failing to close the loop after that coaching conversation has taken place. And so we're going to run through each of these in turn to see how we might avoid them. Before we do that, let's just quickly recap what we mean by instructional coaching. Um, if you've been in some of my sessions for what before, then this will be a good chance for some retrieval practice and review for you. Um, if you are new to instructional coaching, then hopefully this will give you a very, very quick overview of what we mean by it. So it's probably easiest to start with traditional professional development before we talk about instructional coaching. What does prof traditional professional development look like? Well, it's usually something like this, actually. There's one person speaking to a room full of people, and they're trying to communicate a message. They're trying to give a bunch of information to all of those people. And I think that traditional professional development has its place in a school. Often it's really necessary, often it's really helpful, often it's the most effective and efficient way to communicate particular messages or to build particular understanding. But by itself, I think that it doesn't really develop great teachers within a school. So how is instructional coaching different? Well, instead of having all of the school staff, all of the teachers uh, receiving the same information from one person, Every teacher has an individual coach. That means that within a school, you might have uh, five or six teachers who are all coached by the same person, but they will be coached individually. So that coach who has six, for example, coaches, will see each of them individually. And that means that across a normal sized school, you might have something like five or six coaches, maybe slightly more in a larger school, maybe in a larger secondary, maybe slightly fewer in a smaller primary school. But you have a coach with a relatively small caseload of, of coaches, and every coach has, coachee has that one person who they know will come to see them to help them to develop. Matthew Kraft tells us about the five criteria associated with really effective instructional coaching. And those five criteria are that it's individualized, intensive, sustained, context specific, and focused. So that's what we should be aiming for in these coaching sessions. And notice how professional development of the traditional type that we looked at earlier doesn't really fulfill any of these criteria. It's certainly not individualized. It's not particularly intensive. Um, it's rarely sustained over time. It's often not focused, it's often quite generalised messages, and it can't really account for context specificity. It can't really take into account that some teachers are more experienced than others, or some teachers are English teachers and, and others are PE teachers, or some teachers uh, work in early years, while, whereas others work in upper key stage two. It has to treat all teachers as if they have exactly the same experience, expertise, um, specific professional development needs and goals and all of that can often lead to frustration when you're on the receiving end of that training. Instructional coaching aims to meet all of those five criteria.
So what would a normal coaching cycle look like? Well, it should be ideally weekly, certainly every two weeks, and shouldn't really go any longer than that without seeing your coach. Otherwise, it's not really intensive in the way that Matthew Kraft specifies. And so a normal coaching cycle uh, for us would look something like this. First of all, the coach would drop in on their coachee. That drop-in takes about 10 or 15 minutes and they drop into their classroom. It's relatively informal. They'll perhaps watch some teaching, um, maybe speak to some children, look at some books, and gather the data that they need to identify an action step, identify one thing that that teacher could do differently that would help to improve their practice, help to develop them as a teacher. And what they'll then do is have a coaching conversation following that drop-in with the teacher. They'll give them some feedback on the lesson and they'll agree an action step, one thing to do differently. Then they'll practice that action step with the teacher. The final part is for the teacher to enact the step. So in their next lessons, they'll try and put that action step into practice. And we want to keep this loop as tight as possible. So preferably having that coaching conversation within a day or two of the drop-in where it's still fresh in both the coachees and the coach's mind. And from that coaching conversation, you want that action step embedded into practice as quickly as possible. And then another drop-in where there's a chance to see that in action again as quickly as possible. So this cycle stays really tight. And the whole thing maintains momentum. And coaching keeps really regular and incremental and becomes just a natural part of the teacher's rhythm in terms of their normal development. It, it's really low stakes. It's low stakes because it's not attached to performance management. You're not getting a, a formal judgment on your teaching. You're just getting regular small development steps working with a more experienced teacher with more expertise who is able to both uh, be an extra set of eyes in your lessons and um, help you to identify particular gaps that you might have missed and then also work with you to uh, help you to close those gaps. So, instructional coaching sounds good. Sounds maybe easy, it's not easy. There are lots of ways to mess up instructional coaching. Believe me, I've done them. And these are the five top ways to mess up instructional coaching, I think. I hope that you can learn from my mistakes. And the first is this one, that there's no shared vision or, of uh, excellence. There's no underlying principles of great teaching and learning that act as a blueprint, that act as guiding principles in, on which to base your understanding of A, what the gaps are, and, and B, what to do about them. And where this goes wrong is, is where instructional coaching just becomes a teacher sort of um, picking kind of scattergun things uh, that are perhaps uh, the, the most obvious or um, perhaps the most visible, or maybe even just sort of talking to you about the sorts of things that they do in their classroom. There's no real clear blueprint in terms of this is a real excellence in teaching that we're trying to get to. And so before you even begin with instructional coaching as a school, uh, as a coach and a coachee, you want to try and dig into that domain specific knowledge. You want to try and um, help that coachee to start to develop their own understanding of what really great looks like. And we have good evidence now about what that might, what about great teaching and learning, about the sorts of instructional approaches that are more likely to be successful. Now, the way that you define your vision of excellence or your guiding principles around great teaching and learning will be up to you as a school leadership team and as a school body more generally. Some schools have um, lent on particular frameworks that they find helpful. Um, a couple of popular ones, for example, are Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction, which you can see on the left here. And there are 10 key principles there, which cover pretty much um, everything that you might expect to see in um, uh, the average lesson. And then also uh, another example of a, of a framework which could be useful to sort of adapt and adopt is this one from um, the, the Great Teaching Toolkit from Evidence-Based Education developed by Professor Rob Coe and Dr. Stuart Kine. And so these may well be useful starting points in terms of 
you agreeing. This is sort of what we're trying to get towards. This is what we've agreed great looks like, and this is going to be the basis for our coaching conversations. Are we doing these sorts of things? Are we really clearly breaking down material into its smallest chunks to manage pupils cognitive load? Are we regularly reviewing the key content with the pupils in a way that's effortful for them? Are we questioning regularly to gain a sense of pupil understanding and the misconceptions that they might hold? We don't want any of this to be a surprise or a secret for the teacher. We want this to be really transparent as a clear basis for instructional coaching and so this really needs to be in place beforehand. But you can go even deeper you can start to build up the understanding of principles and evidence of great teaching with your coachee and with staff through a range of different ways. There are three that I'm going to pick out here. The first is the Chartered College of Teaching's uh, Impact Journal, which is a peer-reviewed journal and gives really cutting-edge um, uh, thinking evidence from both educational researchers and practicing teachers who are translating some of that evidence into their practice. A really good way to keep up to date with um, the, the most recent evidence around teaching and learning. The second is, uh, in the middle here, is the EEF guidance reports. And there are guidance reports on um, a, a range of areas of teaching and learning. There's one on special educational needs here, for example. Again, a great starting point for what does the evidence say around this particular area? We've noticed, noticed a particular gap, perhaps, around building pupils' literacy or um, uh, ensuring that continuous provision is um, really intentional in the early years. What's the evidence on what good looks like here, the best way to um, ensure that pupils are successful? And there are also a range of really fantastic educational books at the moment, including the Research Ed series, which is, uh, again, um, uh, uh, based on a, a number of areas of education, including building a great curriculum here. There's, there's one on assessment, uh, another on direct and explicit instruction. Really good starting point for um, having that shared basis of um, what great looks like in the classroom. And I think that it's really important to start with that as a bedrock, as an edifice, before you begin with instructional coaching, so that it doesn't become arbitrary, random, and you don't get massive inconsistencies across different coaches in terms of both the guidance they're giving and the quality, the, frankly, the quality of the conversations and the action steps that are being provided. So step number one, make sure that you have a shared vision of excellence and understanding of what great teaching looks like. Okay, on to number two, the second way that we might uh, mess up uh, instructional coaching. And this is quite a common one, imprecise action steps. This is tough because action steps are really hard to write. You can get better and worse action steps. Where I see um, a, a particular weak instructional coaching is when you have action steps which, which sort of sound like they could have been decided before the coach even went in the room. Um, and this is often when coaches are leaning quite heavily on rubrics like teach like a champion, I think, where they'll pick out a particular strategy like cold calling and they'll, they'll say your action step is cold calling. And it's not really clear why that's the action step. It's not really clear what gap that's going to hold. It's not really clear um, what that gap is going to close. It's not even really clear how that cold calling might be effective because, of course, we can do cold calling really badly. We can do cold calling um, with terrible questions, for example. We can do cold calling at parts of the lesson where it's not really um, uh, most appropriate. And we can do cold calling in a way that sort of acts as a gotcha and kills classroom culture and um, stops you building a, a great culture of error within the classroom. So just saying cold calling as an action step may actually do more harm than good. So what can we do differently? One framework that I found particularly helpful in writing really precise and helpful action steps is um, provided by Adam Boxer, who's the head of science at Tottridge, uh, Tottenham Tottridge Academy. Um, and he uh, explains this as the power of by, but really it's broken up into two parts. The first is with your action step, beginning by ag agreeing the goal. 
with the teacher. That builds buy-in. What are you trying to actually achieve? Ask them, what are you trying to achieve? And you may need to be a helpful guide there in terms of spotting what the goal was in the classroom, the thing that wasn't really happening. So it could, for example, be that the teacher needed to gain a better understanding of pupils' misconceptions. Or it could be that they needed to get all pupils' attention before they gave out instruct the instructions. Or it could be that they needed to ensure all pupils had a really clear understanding of the criteria to include in their answer in the independent task. You can agree on that together, and that's a good way of building, as I say, that shared sort of buying. Yes, this is something that I want to achieve in my class. And you can be clear with them in terms of this wasn't really taking place. So this is the gap we're going to try and close together. And that leads to the second part. How do we do it? And that's where Adam Boxer's power of buy comes in. I want to gain a better understanding of um, pupils' misconceptions. I do that by setting a hinge question to be completed on mini whiteboards. That is the mechanism for achieving the goal. How would I get all pupils' attention? Well, I could give a countdown and scan the room. How could I ensure that all pupils have a clear understanding of the criteria? Well, I could annotate the model exemplar on the board with the steps to success. This way of writing action steps, uh, first of all, um, brings your coachee along with you in terms of being very, very clear on why it's being set because there's something that you want, both want to achieve together and giving them clear criteria in terms of what they should do to close it. So writing action steps in this way allows for that um, a greater level of um, precision, uh, a greater level of focus and also a, a greater agreement in terms of trying to um, get that action step um, uh, enacted within the classroom. Okay, so... On to our third way to mess up instructional coaching, a lack of focus during drop-ins. You are amongst the busiest people on the planet as teachers, leaders, and it's all too easy to think, goodness me, I've got my drop-in. Maybe you're already a couple of minutes late and uh, it's really easy to think, I'll quickly just pop in for a couple of minutes and see what I can spot. Um, I don't really have time to do this. I'm rushing from one place to another, but I'll make sure I go in and show my face. I know I've got my coaching conversation, so I need to make sure I've got in there. And that lack of focus, that lack of preparation, um, can, can really um, uh, hamper and undermine the whole coaching process for a couple of reasons. First of all, your teacher will know. Your coach, you will know that, that you have not gone in with um, a, a, a real sort of presence in terms of I'm honoured and glad to be in your classroom and committed to really digging down and seeing what gaps are, there are here so that I can help you to close them. They'll see if you're not really there. They'll see if you're tapping away at emails at the back. G guilty, I've done that. Um, and so going in with a real clear focus and that preparation in terms of what do I know? And you know your teachers really, really well. What do I know that this teacher is really working on at the moment? What do I know in terms of where this class is at the moment? What do I know in terms of what they're teaching at the moment? All of that, having all of that in mind, will help you go in with a great level of, of focus and allow you to be much more forensic as you try and unpick the gaps and make sure that you pick something that's really salient and relevant for that teacher and doesn't feel like you've just picked the first thing and most obvious thing that came into your head so you could get it out of the way. And so what would you be looking for um, while you're in the classroom? Well there are a couple of sources of information. You're probably going to want to try and see some teaching. It's not always possible based on when you go in, but you probably want to see some teaching because that could be a, a, a really fruitful and actionable um, source of data in terms of giving them an action step and a next step. It's a good idea to, to talk to some children if that's appropriate. Try and get a sense of their understanding because you want to, of course, make sure that um, the, the content is not just taught, but that it's being learned. And pupils can be really a uh, wonderful source at articulating what they're doing to help to give you a sense of what the teacher's achieving. And the last thing is that you might want to look at some pupils' books. It can be quite common for um, uh, great teaching 
um, to, to not necessarily translate into great people's work. And people's work, of course, isn't um, the only proxy of great teaching and learning. It, it could be the case that you're getting great teaching and great learning, um, but not so great books. But it's a useful point in terms of triangulation. It's a useful point of data. And if the teaching is absolutely fantastic and, and, and really clear, and the pupils seem to be learning loads, but their books are a bit of a mess or not really showing and demonstrating that um, the, the skills and the knowledge that they're developing, there probably is some sort of a gap there that needs to be addressed. And so taking all of those sources of data in concert give you a, gives you a much more holistic picture and allows you to have much richer conversations in those coaching conversations and also makes you much more credible in those coaching conversations with your teacher. So, Ensure that you have a real clear focus when you go into those coaching conversations. Okay, so the fourth way to mess up instructional coaching, probably the most common, is that there's not enough practice, and in some cases, not any practice at all. And we know the reasons for this. Uh, practice can be awkward. Um, it can be difficult to get started. Um, it can reveal poor coaching. Um, if you haven't really been clear in the action step, then it can, it can really show that up where the teacher says, I'm not really sure what you want me to do. And that can lead to awkward situations as well. And so for that reason, um, sometimes people just duck it. Sometimes there's a, there's a kind of a tacit agreement amongst coach and coachee that we won't practice, we'll just sort of chat about what we would do in the classroom. And if you don't practice, the chances of actually happening uh, are, are really, really low. Um, it's very unlikely that the teacher is going to develop the sort of automaticity of putting it into practice. They're not going to have that muscle memory. They're not going to build in those cues of it's time to do it. And so it's really, really important that you practice. It's really important that you get the teacher to get up on their feet and, uh, and, and give it a go, whatever you've been talking about, whatever you've identified as the action step, if at all possible, in their classroom. So try and have the coaching conversations in the teacher's classroom. This is also helpful because it means that the children's work will be on hand, They're, they'll probably have their computer there with, with, with planning and with the particular slides that they'll be using. And it also is a bit of a, a neutral ground in terms of uh, um, uh, leveling some of those power dynamics. If it's in your office, then it can immediately feel like quite a, a formal meeting um, where they're sort of uh, being told what to do in um, a, a, a relatively hierarchical way. Whereas if it's in their classroom, they feel like they've got more ownership of it and they'll be ready to practice as if they've got their class in front of them. So we want to try and set them up for great practice and it's difficult to do. We want to try and really be shooting, we think, for probably about half of that coaching conversation to be practice, building in lots of different iterations. The more practice that you can do, building in lots of time for that practice, the more times that they do it, the more chance they'll put it into practice in their classroom and enact it with their actual children, which is the overall goal, of course. There's no point in having great conversations if it never actually changes the teacher's practice. So how can we set it up so that Practice almost happens by accident. Well, we think that this grid can be a really helpful way of doing that. The, the beauty of it is that all you need to do is draw a cross and, you, and you've got it. And you don't even need to print anything off. Just ask the teacher to uh, jot this down in their, in their notebook. And the first thing is, is to clarify that goal. And we would um, encourage you to get the coachee to uh, write their action step down. So they've got it written down there. It gives them time to process it. Then together you'll co-construct the success criteria for meeting that action step. And you can probe them there. What would you do? What would you say? Why? Then give them a minute or two to script what they'll say. This could be bullet points, um, or they might like to write out exactly what they're going to say to meet the action step. Give them time to do this silently, independently. It really sets them up for success because it gives them the time they need to think it through. It gives them time to really prepare. And that mental preparation, that intellectual preparation, is going to be really helpful in ensuring that they actually do this. Because by the time they've gone through that process, it will be kind of strange not to. And by the time they've written a strip, script, it will be weird not to practice. They've just written a script, and so it makes the process of practicing really easy. Because once they've written it and they say, yes, I've finished now, then you can say, great, let's try it out. Great, let's practice. They get up on their feet and they practice with you. As I said, 
Really great coaches push for two, three, four iterations of that practice, slightly tweaking, slightly probing, slightly pushing. Just like a great sports coach makes those tweaks and pushes the, the uh, athlete to uh, try again and again and again, improving very slightly each time. Great coaches in schools do exactly the same thing. Tell them what they were doing really well. Make it link to the success criteria and then push them just to make a small improvement. Get them to do it again and again and again. We don't do it until we can get it right. We do it until we can't get it wrong. Building that automaticity is the key. So number four, make sure that you do practice. I hope this grid will help. The fifth and final way to mess up instructional coaching is to fail to close the loop. What do I mean by this? Well, we know that in making great habits, and that's what we're trying to do with our teachers, we're trying to build great habits in them, there are three key components. The first is making sure that there's a really clear cue. And you should have planned this in in your coaching conversation. When specifically are you going to do this? When in the lesson? Which lesson? And so they've got that cue there, hopefully. They then need a clear routine in terms of what to do. They need to have practiced the routine and you'll have done that in your practice. But the third part of making great habits is to ensure that there's a kind of reward built in. And one way that you can reward uh, this uh, change in, in practice, this new habit, is by spotting it and praising it, by making sure that it happens. Your teacher will quickly realise if you're not really going in and checking that stuff has happened. Now, of course, they shouldn't be doing it because they're performing for you, but if you can build up that um, if you can build up that momentum by constantly going in and checking it, then it's going to be much more likely to take place in, in the future. It's going to be, your teacher's going to be much more likely to try and work on the next action step with you. And so closing the loop is really important to help build good habits. But there's another reason that we want to close that feedback loop. Instructional coaching is aimed at developing great teachers for the benefit of pupils, we want to see pupil outcomes improve. And so much professional development isn't evaluated in terms of pupil outcomes. We never check to see whether we're actually having a great impact. If it's not improving what pupils are doing, if it's not increasing their knowledge, making them more proficient in the sorts of skills that we want them to develop, there's no point in doing it. And so our job is to close that feedback loop in terms of checking to see, is this happy, having the intended impact? Because if it's not, then something needs to change. We need to perhaps choose different action steps um, or maybe practice more or maybe break down the action steps further um, or, or maybe take a different approach entirely in terms of what we're spotting and, and the sorts of things that we're noticing in lessons. Maybe we need to focus on a different area completely. Maybe we've been trying to focus on formative assessment when it turns out that actually there are some much more foundational um, behaviour and culture um, um, aspects that need to be dealt with first. So by closing that feedback loop, you ensure that the instructional coaching is having that intended impact. Okay, so thanks for staying with me. Um, those were five ways to mess up instructional coaching and hopefully um, a few tips on how to avoid them. So instructional coaching, um, it is just a conversation, but it's not just a conversation. And you need to bear in mind these key sorts of criteria that underpin it, acknowledging that it's really difficult, uh, leaning on that structure that's going to help you to uh, work through coaching conversations in a way that maximise success for teacher development and also improving pupil outcomes um, and acknowledging that this is a process, that, that um, coaching is, is something that you get better at with time, um, uh, but maintaining focus on at least these five areas I think is a good place to start in improving and developing your own coaching practice. I hope that they're helpful. I'll see you soon. Thanks very much for listening.